we arrive at one of Borges' self-proclaimed masterpieces. I quote, perhaps my best story, which I guess was translated from Acaso Mi Mejor Cuento, uh, from the prologue of the artifices. El Sur by Borges. <laughs> I wonder, there's got to be some more writings out there about why it's his favorite. Like, the fact that he knew that it was like a narrative story, but there's a secret story. And it kind of reminds me of like that James Joyce quote where he's like, oh, this will keep people chasing down the, the real meaning that I meant for hundreds of years. <laughs> Every Borges story has layers. And this one obviously has many layers as we go through the different existential crises that seem to happen over and over to this poor guy. Yeah. <laughs> so let's get into it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, there's always patterns, right? So in the beginning, how did you take this? It starts with the generational story. And obviously this isn't the first Borges story to explore that, right? The, the main character is Juan and, and it's told from, I think it's worth pointing out. There's like an unnamed narrator that can for some reason, know of Juan's thoughts, things that he shouldn't know. It's it's it, it's it's very uh, omniscient, mm -hmm. but it talks about his his grandfather, right? Who came from um, things like Germanic backgrounds. He identified more with the 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 Argentinian, but his grandfather comes over is kind of like a settler, like that that rough and tough man, if you will, that we kind of like romanticize. And I think they even use the word romanticism several times in the story. A and he dies. Man. He, well, yeah, but he dies in this big war, in this manly way, uh, this glorious way, fighting for what he believed in sort of thing that, to me, it set up this juxtapositional thing of of reverence for the past, almost. Like, how did you take the, the situation of why the grandfather's there? I took it as rural versus urban. So you have this direct contrast between the city boy, who is eventually going to go out and try to soil his royal oats in nature versus his grandfather, who is this, you know, yeah, tough war veteran that died a hero's death. Mm hmm. You know, and it's it's worth pointing out. I don't know how much to wait to put into this. Maybe there's like a famous cri critic about this. Uh, a, U a YouTuber commented on this, not to discredit YouTubers, but you can't trust them. Just saying. <laughs> but they, they told me that <laughs> Borges uh, basically had this like kind of like complex that when when he's referencing these these gauchos, these these cowboys that settled the South, which is the equivalent of, of you know, cowboys settling the West to us Americans, that there's a certain amount of um, it's like a, a combination of reverence with jealousy, even the way that, you know, Borges, he's a little bit like our boy Juan to kind of jump into Juan. He's, he was a librarian, right? He had some accidents and he started to go blind, essentially, like in terms of like losing his vision. And he starts to wonder, like, you know, he's never going to live like that life, like the, the, the macho man type thing, that there's a certain amount of reverence or even just disgust with yourself, too. And you can kind of see that with Juan being the librarian that longs to go to the ranch but never did he, he's that city life i guess to your point longing for the romanticized view of what it means to live a kind of like that cowboy life i think the romanticization is spot on because you have that untamed wild west whether you're in south america or the united states there was always this uh personification of cowboys and gauchos and that uh, you know, in the dime novels, the lives, you know, uh, that they lived were always something that was envied and that people liked that because it was very different than their humble, simple city lives. It, it, and maybe it's because it was different. And that's kind of a thing that I think a lot of us, we always think maybe the grass is greener on the other side of, oh, I live in the city and it's the blah, blah, blah. And what do people do in the city? Go for vacation. They go out to the countryside. Where do the countryside people go? They go to the big city for vacation. So it's, I think it's just innately in us that we always seem to fantasize about that thing that is different than what we have. And I think something that is generally somewhat universal, like don't get me wrong, some people just don't want change, don't want to make a wave. But there's something to be said about this weird desire humans have to live eternally. And sometimes that comes in the shape of leaving a mark, leaving a legacy, 
if you will. And that's not to say that you can't be a big businessman and run the city life, but I think there's something to be said about settling new land, making something yours that has never been explored before. It, it, it's a it's a part of immortality of like, you know, like when someone creates towns, they name streets after you, they name buildings mm. after you, right? It's yeah. part of the immortalization sometimes that we humans crave. Yeah, exactly. And, and Juan here, I think, is not only maybe wanting to see the past of his grandfather, but also connecting to it. There is something about having a bond that is personal. You think of the mementos that we hold on to of trinkets and knickknacks, uh, you know, photos and videos, and they don't necessarily have those things back then. But if he can make this connection to the land that his grandfather had, maybe he'll feel more connected to his grandfather and he'll feel different or empowered in some way. Mm -hmm. Well, in 39, um, Quan had a picture, I think it was, uh, in, in like the old sword. Like you're 100% right, he's holding on to artifacts, whatever those artifacts may be. Yeah. Um, I, I guess that kind of transitions us to, I think it was 1939, when he's like reading Arabian Nights, which oddly enough came up in both stories <laughs> that we're recording tonight. But he, he bumps his head on something. Well, was it a window ledge? Was it... A door? I, I don't know. Was it a bat? <laughs> he hits his head. <laughs> yeah, he hits his head. But I think it's part of that obfuscation that Borges does where even if he does come out and say it, you're almost starting to kind of still questioning it because we transition from this to me generational story to what is Juan's story, right? Because he, he like goes, <laughs> I mean... I don't know what kind of a head bump this was, but like sepsis comes up. He, he He's sick and, and really bad in his bed for a week and then decides he has to go to the hospital, the sanatorium. Like, I'm like, oh my gosh, like what, what the heck happened to Juan? Like what, <laughs> did, he, did he have a tetanus shot, not have a tetanus shot or something? Like he really <laughs> went down for what I thought was just like a leading somewhere totally different. And it, and it made the story very different about what is Juan's idealized self, I thought. It seemed to escalate very quickly of... Suddenly he's like, oh, somebody left the door ajar and I bumped my head. And then suddenly he's in the hospital with sepsis and dying. And I think that maybe for me, Borges took it to that level because you really don't start to question life until your life has been questioned. And now that he stared death's face, he's thinking to myself, I've, I've got to change. And going out to the countryside is a big change for Juan, leaving the, the safety of the city, leaving the sanctuary of his library. He's making a big change in his life. And I think that is something that he sees that maybe his grandfather would be proud of. And then he goes out into you know the wilderness mm. and become a man's man. Because the gauchos were kind of revered for that. I mean, they were they were tough dudes. That's an interesting point, because... If you remember, like, <laughs> it was kind of weird. It was like almost like like a clockwork orange where you have like these horrific experiments being done on you, which yes. might be questionable. Like you're not even yeah. sure if it's real. Like am I being locked <laughs> up in the basement of some mad scientist dream type of thing? Like you're not even sure it's real, right? Like are we actually in an insane asylum is one of the things that I, I, I went to the Shutter Island effect too of like, like, is this, is this reality? Like, are we, or are we in his head and we're actually in like this, like the insane asylum the whole time is kind of one of the things that I was wondering. But to, to, to touch on your point that you just said, I think that's really interesting because he says he hates his identity or something along those lines. He hates himself. And is it like he hates his city life and, and that's why he wants to reject it because he thinks his grandfather would embrace him because his he thinks his real identity might be the, the the rough, tough cowboy, even though he has no experience. And it's not that I think he wants to be a cowboy. It's that he hates everything that he is like. He's not proud of himself, so he just needs to change. And he thinks that changing into the cowboy would would make him happier, essentially. And then we get to the kind of climax of the story is he gets not all the way through his journey. He, he doesn't even complete his journey. Well, we don't, don't know what happened, actually. But this train stops that he's on because he's going down to the south back to where, you know, his family is from and his grandfather. The train pulls over and he goes into a restaurant or general store or bar or something. And he sits down and some of the locals start messing with him because they probably obviously see that he's a city boy and he 
inadvertently gets into a knife fight. And, you know, at the end of the story, of course, in Borges fashion is left open ended of this guy's going to go into a knife fight, has no clue how to use a knife, maybe. And that's it. Like, what happens to this poor guy? Well, it's like we sometimes have this vision of who we think we are like this actualized self like that we think we can become and then there's there's the practical self of what you decisions you make right like that, that really define you and what the external world see and sometimes we have all this theory about what to do and it's it's that old quote right like everybody has a plan until the first punch or something like that like, he thinks he's going to be this rough and tough gaucho. He thinks he's going to be this guy. But he has no practical experience being that guy. So as soon as things get rough with the knife pulled, and he's given that knife, and he knows even having that knife won't do anything, I think he's starting to realize that the actualized self might not actually be attainable by him because he, he doesn't actually have enough practice with it, right? And even in traditional Borges mind trickery, you get the concern that, oh, wait, this would have been such a better and more glorious way to die than of sepsis at the sanatorium. So is he really mm. actually kind of like the night face up, if you remember by uh, Julio Cortazar, is he really actually, are we flipping reality? And he actually is back at the sanatorium or insane asylum going crazy from his sepsis, you know, go, having visions, and he's just envisioning his actualized self about how he would die gloriously. So picking up the knife is giving himself an honorable death because he's really dying of bumping his head on a window or a door and he's dying pathetically and he's trying to glorify death because of how he felt his grandfather would have looked upon him. Oh, that's gut wrenching. <laughs> well, well, think about the knife. That could be him looking at the scalpel from the doctor performing Ooh, painful yeah. surgeries on him. The the idea that the remember it so we kind of skipped over like when he when he got released, he went back to the city and everything was beautiful. It was great. It was gorgeous. The lights of Buenos Aires, right? Because that's comfortable to him. That's practical. He knows how to live in that environment. He can't even get to his dang ranch because he got kicked off the train and such or whatever it was. And, and and there's the dang cat, where it's like the cat might not even be there. It goes to uh Schrodinger's cat, if you remember. You don't know if the cat's alive or dead in the box until you measure it, right? The cat could be alive or the cat could be dead, right? He mm. could be alive in this actualized self or he could be dead, right? And, and the real reality is that he's actually back in the sanatorium potentially imagining all of this. And you won't know whether he would live or die in the south until you measure it, until you take it. When the practical becomes or when the when the actualized self is 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 done and then you become like the practical self it's it's a very interesting way of looking at it i think and it to me it's like all these different stories clash in a very strange way where it's like you almost got to reread it to like come to your final conclusion of the story yeah and i want to i want to read the last line because i think it kind of plays into that dalman firmly grips the knife which he may have no idea how to manage, and steps out into the plains. How did you think that he may, may? Maybe he does know how to use it. I just thought, oh, maybe there's some hope there. Maybe. Wait, did, <laughs> was that was that the last line? Did, did the tense change in the last line compared to the rest of the story? Yeah, I mean, I, I read it verbatim. Dude, I... What does that mean? The fact that the tense changes. Yeah. Is that, is that, a, is that, a, I wonder if that, well, no, because Andrew Hurley, I know the translator, I think you're reading the same translation as me. He worked with Borges on that translation, like painstakingly accuracy, because uh, Borges was trying to coach him on it. So why would he, why would the, that realization change basically? Like that's kind of interesting to think about. Yeah. The whole thing is in past tense. And then it says, he may have no idea how to manage and steps out into the plains. Not stepped, steps. Yeah. <laughs> Dang wow. Borges, man. Teaching us, teaching us years you know, later. <laughs> Gotta yeah, love it. Yeah, yeah. 
Definitely, definitely an amazing writer. Definitely one of my top writers. Obviously, you can tell if you go to the Borges playlist down below, we're up to like, what, I think 15 Borges stories. The I hope you are joining yeah. us. <laughs> I hope you're joining us on that journey. Check out the playlist down below. Let us know what your interpretation is of the story. What was Juan's real driving factor? Was he actually in the, in the South or was it all actualized? Looking forward to hearing from you guys. My name's been Una. Peace. Peace.